Welcome back to our course on operating systems. After we took a look at processes and lightweight variations of processes like threads and fibers in the last section, we'll now take a closer look at what happens when we actually execute some of these processes parallel to each other so they run concurrently on the same machine at the same time. So if we look at processes once again, We've seen that processes are defined as programs in execution under the control of the operating system and processes serve as the abstraction for control flows in computers. We've seen that on a conceptual level processes are independent so they have their own control flow, their own memory, their own I.O. devices and so on. But on a technical level it doesn't work that way because we may have only one CPU in our computer. So if we have multiple processes running at the same time on our computer, we have to share the CPU and other resources like memory and IO devices between multiple processes, which means we have to multiplex our CPU. So the task of the operating system is to determine when a process has had enough of its CPU time, so when it is to be preempted and if another process is chosen uh, to now occupy the CPU, which of these processes that are currently ready uh, should get the CPU, so in which order processes are executed. Processes have an address space, so they need memory to work, memory for their code and for their data. And we've seen to create the illusion that a process has all the memory of the machine of, uh, for its own, uh, we need some hardware support usually and this hardware support provides the abstraction or illusion to the process that it has all the address space for itself. So these are only logical addresses which are not in that form available to physical memory. So the memory management unit in our computer maps these logical addresses to real physical addresses with which we can then access real memory chips. And we've also seen that processes can be enabled to share code and data areas. We've seen threads and fibers that operate in the same address space. And the operating system can also map a single physical memory area, so like a single page of memory, into multiple address spaces of multiple processes using the MMU. And it can also share data of the operating system itself. And this should obviously uh, take place in a very controlled way in order not to create more security problems. So let's take a first look at an example for shared data. Here we see a simple list implementation in C. So this is a linked list. So for a linked list you usually have a number of elements here and these elements consist of a payload, so the actual data we want to store inside of our list and then it's a linked list, so we need to indicate which is the next element in the list. And in C, this is usually done by declaring a pointer. And this pointer just points to just another one of these struct elements. So it's a struct element pointer. So if we have one struct element and another one, this next pointer can then point to the next struct element in our list. Now what we also have to do when we work with uh, linked lists, we have to provide a data type for list administration. So we need to know where the list begins because, well, we need to want uh, search through the list if a certain element is maybe part of the list. And we also need to know where the list ends. So we need to know where to attach new elements to in case our list uh, should grow longer. So in this struct list, we have a pointer to a struct element again which is the head pointer to the beginning of the list. And then we have something a bit more special here, which is an optimization. We have a pointer to a pointer to a struct element, which we call tail. So in very many list implementations, this tail pointer just directly points to the last struct element in the linked list. This makes it a bit difficult to work with because then if there is no single element in the list, so our list is empty, we would need some special case to handle that. So here we use a little trick. By using a pointer to a pointer, we can actually directly point to this pointer next inside of the last struct element in our linked list. And by doing this, we can very easily, as we'll see in a bit, 
Uh, yeah, add elements to a list of arbitrary lengths, including zero. So now we need to add functions to add elements to the list and maybe also remove elements. But let's just say we have a function to add elements to the list. So this function here is called in queue. So in queue is passed our list administrative data structure. So a pointer to a struct list. And the caller of NQ has created a struct element somewhere. And a pointer to the struct element then is passed as the second parameter to NQ. So this is the element we want to add to our list. So what do we do to add an element to our list? Now first we need to set up this newly passed item which should end up at the end of our list. And to do this we need to set the new elements next pointer to null. Then we have this tail pointer here. So this tail pointer <coughs> actually points to the current last element's next pointer. So what we do here is the current last element is now the second to last element. So it needs to point to our new element here that we pass. So we dereference the pointer to list tail. So we only have one pointer left here. So a struct element pointer next and initialize this with our pointer to item. So this makes our former last element, which is now the second to last element after we added the new one, actually be a good member of our list because as all the other elements in the list, it now points to its successor. And finally, we need to update our list administrative structure. So our list tail element here, because now we have a new tail, we have an added element to the list. And this is the address of item next, because we need to add a pointer to this again. So let's take a look at a scenario for a, s a simple linked list in C. And what can happen if multiple threads, so threads share an address space as we've seen, if multiple threads actually try to add elements to the list. So here we have a function in Q as we've seen before with our three operations. And we have two threads and you see these wiggly lines uh, just indicate it's a thread. And at some point in the execution in the control flow of thread one, thread one calls NQ for our list, which is passed as the address of a list control element L. And it wants to add a new element, which we call E1 here. So this might be our list element E1. This contains an A as our payload and we don't really know what its next pointer points to. Thread 2 does almost the same. So it also runs and somewhere in its control flow it also decides to add an element to the same list. So also to the address of L as a list administrative structure. And it wants to add an element E2. So this is element E2 here on the right hand side, which contains a B as a payload and also doesn't know anything about its next pointer. So initially our list is empty here. So our global list element L just contains of the information that, well, uh, the first element is null. So there are no elements in the list. And the tail element actually points to itself. So this means the first one is the last one. It's a tail element. And essentially we have an empty list in the beginning. So what's interesting now is to see in which orders our threads, remember they run in parallel, can access this list and what happens afterwards. Let's first look at a simple case. So this case just executes thread one first. Thread one gets to insert its element into the list. And afterwards, thread two comes and adds its own element E2 to the list. So thread one calls NQ to our list L of the element E1. So this is our initial state. We have our empty list here and we have our element E1 that we want to add. So the first thing our NQ function does for thread one is it sets the next pointer to, of our item that we just passed to NQ here as E1 to null. So this is changed to null, nothing else happened. Now in the next step we see 
that our tail pointer is changed to point to the next element. So now we have an additional element on our list. So we start with our uh, pointer here and let this point to our newly passed item here, our newly passed element. And finally, we also need to update the let's tail pointer to point to the next pointer of the newly added element. So our tail pointer here in our list administrative data structure now points to this null pointer, which we just configured above directly. So we know that this is actually the last element in our list. Okay, we're finished. We have a list with an additional element here. So now thread two comes and also wants to enqueue something, this element E2 here on the right hand side, which was just completely ignored before. So the first step again is to set the next field of our item to null, which happens here. Then we change our list pointer to point to the item. So this is now interesting because it changes the tail pointer of the previous last element. So that one here to point to our newly passed element. So this is this in direction that we just add. So this was the former tail pointer and we change its contents to now point to our new item element. And then we update our list so that we know that the list's tail now actually resides with our element E2 here. Uh, so we change this pointer here now to point from the here to over there to item E2. So this is a simple case. This is a valid list that was created. Everything's in order. So no worries. We can have two processes or two threads running in parallel and we have a valid list. But of course it can get more complicated. So we've already seen the situation that a thread can be interrupted and preempted. So whenever a thread's time slice, for example, has been used up, the operating system can interfere, for example, using a timer interrupt and switch to a different process. And this is exactly what happens here in our second case. So now the execution of thread two overlaps the execution of thread one. So the first thing that happens as before is that we set the next element to null in E1 and set the list's tail content to point to the item. So now we have the information that A is part or E1 is part of a list. Now, what we're missing is the third instruction here, which is only down here. So it doesn't uh, get executed right now because what happens after executing the second instruction for thread one is we get a process switch. And by coincidence, this process switch leads to the execution of uh, the NQ function for thread two, which tries to add its element E2. So let's take a look at what happens now. So first, the item's next element for E2 is set to null. That's perfectly fine. Then, uh, well, we add item to our list at the end. Whoops. And finally, we set the tail to our next tail. So what has happened? Well, actually, the information that we have a new element of the list has not yet been updated because that happens exactly after the last process switch in our example here. This is our last instruction as a part of the function nq for e1. Now nq tries to update the list pointer to point to our next element, which means that this pointer now points to here. And what we have here now is an inconsistent list because we have one pointer pointing to the B element, the other one pointing to the A element. But you see the A element actually isn't linked to B and we don't have a direct link from our list start to the first element. So our data structure is inconsistent using this data structure. So if we try to find an element in this afterwards would not work because if we follow the pointers, we would end up somewhere where we don't belong. So essentially what happens here is that a critical section and this critical section consists of these two instructions. So the first one setting the dereference list to tail pointer to item and 
the other one, sending the list to tail element to the next element, so indicating the new end of our list. These were interrupted by something operating on the same data, on pointers here. And because this happened, our data is inconsistent, uh, so essentially we need to find ways to be able to avoid such a situation. Now this problem does not only occur in linked lists, so this is always a nice example and you can see it in many textbooks. It also occurs in other shared memory pr uh, yeah, data structures like shared memory that's just used to communicate between processes, so in systems that provide such a shared memory service. Uh, for threads and fibers, of course, because threads and fibers are designed to have a joint data space, so they provide concurrent access to the same variables by default. Also, this problem can occur for operating system data, which are used to coordinate the access of processes to non-divisible resources. And this can be a file system. So, for example, what, uh, when you don't take care, two processes might try to add a file to the same directory and might end up in a very similar situation as with our linked list. The process table, if two processes are created at the same time using fork, for example. Memory management, if two processes try to allocate a, a bit of memory, and so on. And we've already seen this example for devices like terminals, printers, network interfaces. We've seen our example that two processes try to write to the printer at the same time, and the output is a mixed text document that might be quite confusing. There's an additional case which is very similar. And this is a special case relevant to operating system, and this is interrupt synchronization. So interrupt synchronization is a thing we are going to talk about later when we talk about devices. Uh, just uh, to be sure to mention this here already, uh, so interrupt synchronization also requires uh, synchronization of accesses to data, but methods that work for synchronizing processes here do not necessarily work for interrupts, but we'll discuss this in detail later. So the problem showing up when running two processes that operate on the same data in parallel, uh, this problem is called a race condition. So a race condition is defined as a situation in which multiple processes access shared data concurrently and in addition, at least one of the processes manipulates the data. So when a race condition occurs, we've seen that the resulting value of the shared data depends on the order of accesses by the processes and can actually be an incorrect value. So the result is therefore unpredictable because it depends on the order the processes execute and interrupt each other. And if we have overlapping accesses, we really don't know what the outcome is. So to avoid these race conditions, because of course we want our computers to be deterministic, concurrent processes need to be synchronized. So what's synchronization? Synchronization is just a term uh, indicating that we need to coordinate the cooperation of processes. So we need to define orders of processes and we need to define which parts of these processes need to run undisturbed in order to really create yeah, consistent data structures in memory. So uh, on a local level, we have an order for the activities of concurrent processes. And if you view this on a global level, so on the administrative level of the operating system, synchronization then enables the sequentiality of activities. So it means we put activities in a given order, uh, which is then more or less predictable. So. In the case of race conditions, we've seen that n processes, so at least two processes, compete for the access to shared data. And we've already seen that this code that is actually critical here, so this code that may not be interrupted, uh, is exactly the code accessing this critical data. And this code fragment here, so this part of the code of your program, is called a critical section. So we've seen that interrupting this critical section may lead to errors like in our share, uh, linked list. So essentially what we need to do is we need to ensure that only a single process can be in the critical section at the same time. 
Note that there is not only one critical section in the whole system, but a critical section depends on the data you're accessing. So if you have two data elements, one and two, one process is in the critical section for data uh, uh, element one and the other one for data element two in a completely different memory range. This is not a problem. So what we need to protect is critical sections that do the same thing. So access the same data in different processes. So let's look at a first solution here. And the first solution we can employ are so-called log variables. A log variable as shown here is just an abstract data type. We just call it log with a capital L and we create an instance of this variable just called log with a lowercase l. And log gives the status of the log and in order to use this lock, like a lock on your door, for example, you need to have operations. So for a door, you need to lock something and unlock something. For locks in computer science, we usually say we have two operations that work similar. The first one is called acquire, and the second one is called release. So we name them differently because, uh, yeah, acquiring something doesn't really mean you succeed and that's the uh, point behind this. So acquire just means you try to access the lock, but if that has been locked before, you cannot uh, just continue working. So our NQ function now has two functions added here. So first, we before we enter this critical section, and we've seen these two instructions make out our critical section, we try to acquire our lock. And after we finished with our critical section, we release our lock again, so another process that tries to enter this critical section can proceed. So acquire has some special semantics. So acquire tries to get the lock. If the lock is unused at that point in time, it can just proceed. It locks from the inside, so it locks the critical section itself, executes the instruction of the critical section, and then just unlocks it again. However, if we were trying to execute this acquire function and this critical section was already locked by another process running in parallel, then this acquire function blocks and it blocks as long as the other process that has just held this lock uh, is unlocking this again using its own release function. So essentially acquire means, well, you have to wait until this is free and as soon as it, free, as it is free you can enter the critical section and please don't forget to release it because if you forget it well no other process can enter this critical section ever again. So releasing doesn't take any waiting because you just open the lock and you're out of the critical section so this doesn't imply any blocking whereas acquire can block in case the critical section is already currently used by another process. So how do we implement these locks? Because that was just, of course, a use case. And first we could try a very naive implementation and it's printed in bold and red. This implementation doesn't work, it's incorrect. But still, we want to show you that it's a bit more difficult than just going the way of least resistance to get a correct lock implementation. So let's say our lock abstract data type here is just defined to be an unsigned character. And Let's say the initial value is zero, so zero means our lock is open, is unlocked, and anything other than zero means our lock is locked, so other processes have to wait. So we can try to write a function acquire like this, so we are passed a pointer to our lock variable here, and uh, we could just wait. So that's exactly the semantics we just talked about on the previous slide. So while this lock, so we get past the pointer to it, so we have to dereference it, while this lock is held, so while the contents of the variable lock are not equal to zero, this is exactly what this while loop means here, then we just wait. And you see this very often in lock implementations, that an empty loop body, so just waiting until something happens, is just indicated by this semicolon here after the while loop. So this semicolon means we have an empty loop body, so we execute an empty instruction, so no instruction at all inside of our loop. So this while loop just continuously checks for our lock, and as long as it's not zero, it just checks for our lock again and again and again. So 
Uh, this empty loop body is very easy to overlook, so really take care when looking at implementations like this. And as soon as log has uh, became zero, so our critical section was freed by some other process, well, the only thing our acquire function needs to do is to set the log itself to one, so it indicates now it itself is the owner of our log. Then it returns, so our critical section gets executed, and eventually uh, the process that ran in this critical section calls release, so release is just passed uh, the same lock again, and we've seen release just needs to open this lock again, so all the release does is just reset this lock to zero. So, well, at first this looks pretty nice, so why is this incorrect? Let's take a closer look. Now, the problem is that actually a process switch can acquire, uh, occur anywhere. So not only inside of your user program, but also inside of this acquire function, which might be a library function, for example. So what can happen is that exactly between uh, the end of the while loop, so as soon as your process has determined, okay, the lock is free, and the process trying to set this lock for itself, a process switch can happen. So exactly at this point where this arrow points to, and then another process by coincidence could have entered the acquire function, also found the lock still empty because we didn't get a chance to set it yet, and also exits the loop. And now two processes, our one here and the other one that was just switched to, uh, ultimately set the lock to one at the same time which means they return from our acquire function, which means both processes enter the critical section at the same time. So they manipulate the same data at the same time, exactly what we wanted to avoid. So with this very primitive, naive implementation, we actually just moved the problem one level deeper because we moved our critical section to be inside of our acquire function, which obviously gives us the same problems as before. So if this happens, two processes could enter the critical section simultaneously. That should actually be protected by a crier. So this implementation is no, of no help. Of course, if you think about this, this situation doesn't happen very often. Because, well, it needs a bit of coincidence so that both processes try to run a choir at almost the same time and then a process switch exactly happens between the end of this while loop and uh, us trying to set lock to one. But of course stuff like this can happen and this can lead to errors that are very difficult to find and even more difficult to remove or debug. So essentially what we need to do is we should have some tried and tested infrastructure to reliably implement working logs. And a working solution is a bit more complex. This is called the bakery algorithm in standard textbooks. Now in Norwegian bakeries it's probably not that common, but in American bakeries it seems to be common that when you want to buy something from the bakery, first you need to draw a little piece of paper from a vending machine here. That gives you a waiting number and then there's a big display somewhere that actually shows the number of the next customer and when your number shows up you can uh, proceed to the counter and then uh, make your order. Now. Uh, this probably in Norway or uh, in Germany as I'm used to more or less happens mostly when you're in some yeah, official agency like uh, whatever uh, government's office or something like this where you have to wait. Anyways, uh, the bakery algorithm, so this waiting ticket algorithm is modeled after this real life waiting uh, implementation here for humans. So when a process wants to enter a critical section it gets a waiting number or a waiting ticket and before uh, it enters the critical section the correct waiting number ticket must be indicated here. So uh, the operating system now needs to take care that the admission to the critical section takes place in order of the waiting numbers because obviously that's the sense of these waiting numbers. So that means whenever a critical section becomes free the process with the lowest waiting number is allowed to enter the critical section and when leaving the critical section that process's waiting number is invalidated so it cannot just immediately enter this critical section again. 
We have a number of problems with this. Still, we're going to discuss this. This is a very early solution, as you see. If you look at the literature, this paper is from uh, sometime in the, I think, uh, early 1970s. Now, the problem is that, uh, in contrast to real life, the bakery algorithm cannot guarantee that a unique weighting number is given to only one process. And we'll see in a bit why this is the case. Now, of course, if we have two processes having the same weighting number, they both would actually try to enter the critical section when their number shows up. And in this case, of course, we still need to imply an order. And in the case of just two processes having the same weighting number, the process ID of the processes is used to decide about the priority. For example, the process with the lower process ID number, but the same weighting ticket number, can enter the critical section first. So here's an implementation of our bakery algorithm. So uh, our bakery algorithm now has a bit more complex lock. So this lock has two variables here. And these variables are now arrays because we have to administer all the processes in our system because all of the processes can potentially enter or try to enter a critical section. So we have a waiting number for each of these processes, which can get assigned or reassigned. And we have a Boolean variable, so just a bit, indicating if one of the processes is currently trying to get a new waiting number. And then we have this choosing variable set to true, because uh, this is again some critical moment here. So our require function also gets more complicated. So uh, first we have a helper variable j. This is later used to iterate through all of our processes. And we have another variable i. And this variable i is initialized with the process ID of the current process trying to enter the critical section using the acquire function. So what we do now is first we need to draw a waiting ticket number here. So we indicate that we're starting to draw a waiting ticket number by setting the lock data types choosing variable to true for our own process. So for the index i, so this is why we need n entries, one for each process in the system. Now, as soon as we set this to true, this indication, okay, we're currently waiting for a waiting number, then we can actually try to retrieve this waiting number. And this is stored, of course, in the number array in the element of that array that belongs to our process. So again, index i. And now we need to ensure that we actually hand out waiting ticket numbers in ascending order. So we need to find the next waiting ticket number that is one larger than the largest waiting ticket number that has already, well, or that at least already exists in our system. So we have to go through all of our log numbers for all of our processes here from zero to n minus one for n processes. Then we have to determine the maximum of these numbers. So that's the highest number that's currently in use in the system. And then we add one to it to get a unique new number. After this, we set our choosing Boolean variable to false to indicate, okay, now we finally got a waiting number. And now what we have to do uh, when trying to enter a critical section or before doing this is we have to check all the processes, which of the processes actually has the lowest number. So essentially we are not guaranteed, of course, now to enter our critical section because just we've got a number, but the process that is now allowed to enter is the process with the lowest waiting number that's in use. So we iterate over all of our processes here. And if any of these other processes was also just trying to choose or to get a waiting number, then we have to wait because otherwise the data in our lock duck data structure would be inconsistent here. So while any of the process J we're currently looking at is choosing a waiting number. There's this single semicolon again. We just wait. And then we'll take another look. So uh, there's another while loop that just waits here. So we wait while the lock, uh, the waiting number uh, in our lock data structure for that process is not zero. Uh, 
So there is a valid waiting number x issued for that process, which means that process is waiting to enter a critical section. And that process's number, waiting number, is lower than our process number. So if we have a valid number and this valid number is lower than ours, then this process has to come first and we have to wait. Or the other condition we've talked about, if we actually have identical waiting numbers between the process we just iterated over, J, and our own process, and that process's process ID, J, is lower than our own process ID, which we've got up here, then we also have to wait because we know that in the case of identical ticket numbers, the process with the lower process number comes first. So we only leave this waiting loop uh, while uh, when there is no process with a lower ticket number. That's ensured by the first condition here. And there's no process with an equal ticket number to ours that has a lower process ID. Only then can we actually leave the second while loop and then we leave our acquire function obviously after we iterate it through all of our processes here and we can enter the critical section. Poo, that was a bit and be careful this is pseudocode so if you type it into your uh, editor and try to compile it it won't work right away so you'll need to add a bit so this is just uh, to show the principle and obviously to fit on a single slide. Now release again is much more simple so release just a uh, again gets our pit because we have to modify the waiting number for our own process here and release just sets this waiting number for our own process in the log data structure to zero and as we've seen zero indicates this is not a valid waiting number so waiting numbers obviously start at one. All right so we have a working solution here. Is this a good solution? Well one good thing about the bakery algorithm is it is provably correct. So it can solve the problem of critical sections. But we have a number of problems for practical use of the bakery algorithm. So one problem is that in most cases we actually do not know beforehand how many processes will compete to enter a critical section. So how large does our value of n has to be? And in a typical system, if you look at a Linux system, with the ps command, so process status, you see there are several dozens or even hundreds of processes running at the same time and we would have to include all of them because we don't know which of these processes could maybe try to enter a critical section. So that's not actually a good idea. In addition, process IDs are not necessarily in a range of 0 to n minus 1, so there might, might be gaps in between uh, and so on, so we'd have to handle more real realistic process ID distributions here. But the biggest problem with our bakery algorithm is actually the runtime. Because this acquire function has these two while loops. So the first one is not that critical. This just waits until a waiting number has been chosen for a process that just tried to get one. That might take some time because you have to calculate the maximum over all your end processes, but that's okay. But the other while loop has to iterate over all the processes, over all of our end processes to check these two conditions. If there's a process with a lower waiting number or a process with identical waiting number but a lower process ID. And as it has to go through all of them again, uh, well, this might take quite a lot of time. So essentially, uh, this might es uh, especially take a lot of time because we also have to go through this list of n processes here to iterate over all of them even in cases when no other process holds our critical section, so when the critical section is already free. So in all cases, no matter if you have to wait or not, we have to go through this loop n times, so our computational overhead for the acquire function is O of n, which of course is pretty unacceptable for large systems. So, well, it's a solution. Maybe there's something better. So the question is, can we maybe find a correct algorithm that is almost as simple as the incorrect naive approach we've seen before? One thing we can use is uh, a bit of hardware support here. So 
uh, locks can actually be implemented using atomic operations. So very many processors actually support indivisible or atomic yeah, cycles. What's a cycle? A cycle is essentially, well, a completed operation that, for example, yeah, reads uh, a data wo a value from memory or writes a data value from memory or just uh, yeah, performs an internal arithmetic operation like an addition or multiplication. Now, here we have special cycles which are so-called read, modify, write cycles. So these read, modify, write cycles first read a value from memory, then internally to the CPU change this memory, uh, this value, and then write this value back to memory. Now usually these would be three independent operations. So anywhere between these three machine operations, yeah, a preemption of our process could happen and we have this critical section problem again. So to avoid this, CPUs actually have special methods to indicate this read, modify, write access. So reading something, modifying its value and writing it back is indivisible. So nothing else can come in between and we call this atomic just because, well, you know, a hundred years back, people thought atoms were the smallest particles in the world, of course. Uh, nowadays we know better and we have protons and electrons, but still atomic means indivisible from the old original Greek uh, interpretation of the word. So uh, to do this, we have to go to the machine language level because in regular programming languages like C, there is no standard support for atomic operations. If you look at, uh, well, Google or the GCC or Clang manual, you'll see that there are so-called built-in functions for atomic operations to make your life as a programmer easier and more independent from whatever happens on the machine level so your code gets more portable. But this is not part of the C standard. So in general, well, of course, these built-in functions for atomic accesses are based on exactly the machine instructions we are going to describe here. So which uh, specific functionality for atomic operations is implemented depends on your CPU type. For Motorola 68K processors, these are a bit older now, uh, there's an instruction called test and set. And this already shows this is something to read and modify and write because it tests something and sets it. And test and set just gets passed a memory address here in our require function. So test and set lock actually sets bit seven of the destination operand. And before it does this, it reads the previous value of the destination operand and reflects it in a CPUs or in these CPUs condition code bits. So essentially it indicates, well, was this lock free before? So was it a zero? Or was this lock already yeah, used at the moment we're trying to test it? And then it returns something else than a zero. So what this does is test and set sets this lock in any case. But that's not a problem because there were actually two conditions. Either it was set before, then we have to check if it was set before. So if this lock was already set before, so we didn't change anything, this lock was not equal to zero before. So we have this branched if not equal function and we branch back to our next text and set. On the other hand, if this lock was zero before and we now just set it using our test and set function, then our BNE does not jump here, but just falls through so we can enter our critical section. So test and set is a very nice and simple implementation of an atomic operation. Now Intel CPUs do things a bit differently. On Intel CPUs, there's a bit more versatile instruction called XCHG, simply exchange. So exchange not only tests and sets something, but exchange can be used to exchange the content of a processor register with the content of a memory location, so a variable in memory. So to do this exchange is also passed, of course, the address of a variable, so for a lock variable in memory. And since exchange exchanges a register, and in this case, the AX register of the x86 CPU with the memory location, we need to initialize this AX register before to a valid value. So before we call acquire, we actually initialize our AX register to one and exchange now exchanges 
the contents of the AX register with the contents of log. So the value of AX is stored in the memory location log and the previous value of log before we stored AX in there is put into register AX. So we have the same situation as on the 68K. So if this uh, log was actually not zero, so we compare our AX, so the previous contents of log to zero, and if this was not zero, then we try to acquire it again because we know this log is already in use. So we have to wait and check again and check again and check again until this actually becomes zero and we can continue here. Our processes then have yet another approach to provide atomic operations. So on our processes, you have a pair of instructions, load register exclusive and store register exclusive. And essentially these work in combination. So what we do to implement an acquire function is first, we initialize a register R1 here with a value that indicates this lock will be used, same as on Intel. And then in acquire, we do an exclusive load of the memory location that contains our lock value to register R0. We compare R0 to 0 and only if no other load has come in between. So that's actually checked if something else has happened in between to that memory location. And uh, the comparison was equal to 0. Then we store our new value to log adder. So only if the log was free and we can check that actually between this load and this store, no other exclusive operation has taken place. We acquire this log. And then just to make sure, we still compare it again to see if our operation has succeeded. So this is actually returned in R0 for STRX, whereas STRX writes R1 to log adder. And if this store exclusive here has not uh, actually succeeded because something else has come in between, then we jump back to acquire. Otherwise, we can enter our critical section. More recent ARM CPUs, so version 8 uh, and 8.1, provide additional and better performing atomic instructions, uh, but we won't go into too much detail on this here. So, so far our log algorithms have some significant drawback because the process that is trying to acquire a log has to wait actively. So it's just twiddling thumbs. It's just uselessly running through this loop with, a, with no content, just checking the value of the log over and over again, while it itself is unable to change the condition it's waiting for. So this wastes CPU cycles. It unnecessarily also impedes the other processes, which could make good use of these wasted CPU cycles. Uh, and so it can also harm itself because it does this active waiting because the longer it just waits uselessly in this endless loop, well, uh, in this time, all the other processes cannot continue to run. So they cannot be faster in just freeing the critical section they might just be in there. This problem, of course, only occurs on a single processor system. On multiprocessor systems, we have really parallelly running programs or processes. So essentially there, something else can happen at the same time. So it still is a problem because we're wasting CPU times, but at least we do not hold up any of the other processes which might get scheduled to another processor. Now, what is the actual reason for a problem with critical section? So the actual reason is that a process switch, as we've seen, takes place inside of a critical section. And when this process switch takes place, the operating system interferes and can try to move another process to the running state and move the process that was just inside of its critical section to ready. Of course, this can only happen if the operating system manages to regain control of the CPU. And it can only do this when there's a hardware mechanism to change the control flow execution of the CPU uh, to cause it to enter the operating system kernel itself. And this is usually happening due to an interrupt. So to a hardware signal that comes in and there are uh, interrupts from devices, for example, indicating 
a new character has arrived on a serial interface or a block has been read from a disk or something. Or for scheduling especially, there's a timer device which can generate regular interrupts in intervals and then the operating system can regularly interfere and check if it's time to switch to a different process. So one idea to actually solve the problem of critical uh, sections is, well, to disable interrupts before we enter the critical section, then, well, if no interrupts happen, the operating system doesn't regain control. And currently it, can, it cannot uh, switch the process to another process. So we're running undisturbed. And uh, well, after we leave the critical section, we just enable interrupts again. And we can implement acquire and release using special instructions, which just disable and enable interrupts. So acquire would use a machine instruction used, for example, on Intel x86 CPUs called CLI, which stands for clear interrupt enable, which just means interrupts are disabled. And the release function then can use STI set interrupt enable, so it can re-enable interrupts. So in between acquire, and release, we have our critical section here, uh, which can then run undisturbed. Now this works, and this approach is actually used on small embedded systems to do very fast tasks, but in general, it's pretty dangerous because if a user process would just be allowed to disable interrupts, well, it could also do this for malicious cases where it wants to monopolize the CPU, so no other processes can use this very valuable CPU time. Or you could just uh, crash in between, so your program would call CLI, would suppress interrupts, and then it crashes before it re-enables interrupts. So our operating system might never be able to regain control, or it might end up in an endless loop in between. So this is pretty dangerous. So you need to know what you're going to do. And usually when you run in user mode on the CPU today, you're no longer allowed to execute the CLI and STI instruction. This is something only the operating system kernel or code and running in the privileged CPU mode is actually allowed to do. Uh, here you see some additional bits of syntax. So on the previous slide, we've shown you a sampler source code. You can also include sections of a sampler code directly inside of C code. This again is an extension of many C compilers. So there's an additional keyword ASM for assembly. And inside of this uh, brackets of the ASM command, you just write the text so you see it's just a string here. For the assembly command, you want to be included at this point in the code uh, inside of your function acquire. And uh, this is just passed more or less unchanged to the assembler stage, which then tries to assemble it. So if you try to include an instruction which is just invalid or you do a typo, you get an error message by the assembler instead of the compiler, which might be confusing. But still, this is a very common use case. So if you look at Linux kernel source code, for example, for just including very short assembler sequences without calling out to a special function written in assembler. So suppressing interrupts is a working way to do this, but I would only recommend it for very small and simple microcontroller systems, for example, where actually you know what you're doing, you know which processes are running, and you can really check, hopefully, that everything works as expected.